Let's move on and continue our discussion with the ear. Our ear is used to hear. And when we hear something, we are taking compression waves from our atmospheric molecules and transmitting those compression waves to action potentials in our ear. We find that our ear can be broken up into three main branches or divisions. We have the outer ear, which is made of the auricle or the pinna, and starts with the flap that you see on the outside of your head, all the way to our tympanic membrane. This outer ear will be filled exclusively with air. The middle ear, ideally, will be filled with air. If somebody has an ear infection or water buildup in their ears, the middle ear will have fluid building up in it. But in a perfect world, we would only have air filling up our middle ear. And then finally, we have the inner ear. Our inner ear is filled with fluid, and it will help us with maintaining our sense of balance and with maintaining our sense of hearing. So as we look at the outer ear, let's flip forward to this figure because it's easier to look at the picture while we talk. The outer ear has the auricle or pinna, as it's sometimes referred to as. Um, in ancient times, an oracle was someone that you wanted to listen to. Traditionally, it was believed that they would tell you a message from God. So whenever the oracle spoke, you wanted to listen up. So a, an old school term for the outer ear is the oracle. Another term for the outer ear is the pinna, which is the one your textbook uses. And our outer ear starts at the pinna, and then we have our auditory canal, or ear tube, as many people refer to that as, and then stops right here at the tympanic membrane. What is the common term for our tympanic membrane? The eardrum. Do you have any band geeks in here? Require. And require? We have one. What are the tympani? The tympani? The tympani. Oh, tympani. It's a gigantic drum. It is. It's a gigantic drum in the percussion section. So timp is a root word for drum. So when we say the tympanic membrane, I want you to think of the eardrum, or I always think of the timp tympani. We also have a middle ear. The purpose of our middle ear is to take vibrations from the tympanic membrane and concentrate a large area, pressure from a large area, and concentrate that large area of pressure to a smaller area of pressure. And as that tympanic membrane is vibrating, the pressure it's vibrating with is concentrated to the oval window. The oval window is a membrane that separates the middle ear from the inner ear. Directly over the oval window, we have a bone of the middle ear, an auditory ossicle. This bone that sits directly over the oval window is known as the stapes. As we travel from the outside of the ear to the tympanic membrane, the first auditory ossicle is the malus or malleus. After the malleus, we have the incus, and after the incus, we have the stapes. The malleus, incus, and stapes are the three smallest bones in the human body. And they were involved the first time that forensic anatomy was used to prove a murder in a court of trial. Back in the late 1800s, there was a sausage baron in England, London, England, and he was accused of murdering his wife and grinding her up and turning her into sausage. And the prosecutor presented the fact that they found her finger in one of the meat grinding vats. And the defense countered and said, just because you found a finger doesn't mean she's dead. People can live without a finger. Prove it by showing us a body that she's dead. So the crime scene investigators went back to the vats of meat, and they dug through the vats of meat, and they found a piece of the temporal bone. And it was the exact part of the temporal bone that the auditory ossicles were sticking out of. And then the prosecutors went back to court and said, we found part of her skull ground up in the meat fat. Therefore, she had to have died. And that's the first time that the skeletal system in particular was used to prove a murder in a court of law. 
Now, another structure connected to our middle ear is the auditory tube, or if you're crusty like me, you were taught eustachian tube when you were younger. The purpose of the auditory tube is to equalize pressure between the middle ear and the external environment. So think about when you're going up and down in an airplane or you're driving a vehicle up and down a really steep hill, or if you swim 10 feet down in a swimming pool, you can feel lots of pressure changes in your middle ear. And many times those pressure changes are painful until you do one of two things. You either, if you're swimming down in a pool and you're going deep in the water, you need to increase the pressure in your middle ear by plugging your nose and blowing really hard into nothing. And that forces air into your middle ear to increase the pressure and help equalize it with the water pressing in from the outside. Or if you're in that, an airplane or going up and down a car or a hill, steep hillside, many times if you take the time to swallow, you can force your auditory tube to open up and equalize the air pressure. The next part of our ear is the inner ear. Our inner ear starts at the oval window and is going to involve these structures that we're about to talk about. So we'll start with the, actually let's go back to the picture. It's more fun to talk about while we look at the picture. So we'll start here at the oval window and the stapes will press directly against the oval window. So the stapes will press against the oval window and cause the fluid in the inner ear to become pressurized. As that fluid in the middle ear becomes pressurized, we need somewhere for it to go. You may remember from your freshman physical science class that you can compress gases, but you cannot compress fluids or solids. So as we compress the fluid by pushing against the oval window with the stapes, to relieve the pressure buildup in the inner ear, we have our pressure relief valve, known as the round window. So when I press in against the oval window, the round window bulges out just a little tiny bit to keep our inner ear from being damaged. And as we have these vibrational waves of pressure traveling through the inner ear, they'll travel f through the first part of our middle ear, which is right here, this is the vestibule. They'll travel from the vestibule and move through the seashell shaped organ known as the cochlea. Our cochlea is responsible for our sense of hearing directly. The fluid in our inner ear is also going to go through three loops that we have. These three loops are known as the semicircular canals. And these semicircular canals aid us with our sense of balance. When you look at these three semicircular canals, I want you to think of an X, Y, and Z axis. All three of these canals are perpendicular or 90 degrees from each other based in three dimensions. And that aids us with our dynamic equilibrium. also known as our rotational equilibrium. So we have the stapes, the last ossicle of the middle ear, pressing against the oval window. And then we have fluid waves moving through the cochlea that we interpret as sound. The vestibule itself is going to aid us with static equilibrium. And when I say gravitational or static equilibrium, I'm referring to knowing your orientation in space. Am I upright? Am I upside down? Am I laying on my right side? Am I laying on my right side? Am I face down, back down, so on and so forth? Think of when you jumped up the high dive at a swimming pool and you're underwater and you're all disoriented and discombobulated and your eyes are closed. You still almost always know how to swim up. And that sense of orientation or in space is given to us by the vestibule. And then I want you to think about your rotational equilibrium. Individuals that have, quote unquote, a lot of iron in their nose and never seem to get lost, regardless of how many twists and turns are in the hallway, generally speaking, have really good rotational equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium with their semicircular canals. You can 
throw off your rotational and your static equilibrium by spinning in a circle quickly. And when you spin in a circle quickly, you can make the sensory receptors in your semicircular canals and vestibule send contradictory information to your brain that contradicts the information that your eye is sending to your brain. And when you have those contradictory signals sent to your brain, you feel dizzy or potentially even nauseous. Within the cochlea, that part of the inner ear we used to hear with, we have something known as the spiral organ. In other words, the organ of cordy. Spiral organ is the newer term. Organ of cordy is the crusty term that's being phased out right now. They both mean the same thing. This organ of cordy, or spiral organ, is what we use to take those vibrational waves through the fluid of our cochlea and convert those vibrational waves to electric signals that we interpret as sound. As the fluid in our cochlea is vibrating, we have little hairs in our cochlea that bend back and forth. These are mechanoreceptors we use to take those vibrational waves and turn them to electric signals. So let's look at the picture while we talk about this. If I cause my stapes to vibrate back and forth, that will send pressure waves through the cochlea and arranged all over the cochlea. We have many repeating spiral organs. So let's zoom in on one individual section, cross-section of the cochlea. If we look at the cochlea, there's many tubes that make it up. That's known as a bony labyrinth. And embedded in those tubes, we have repeating spiral organs. And as those vibrational waves move through the fluid of the cochlea, they cause this membrane, known as the tectorial membrane, to move back and forth, which then bends these little hairs back and forth. These little hairs are called stereocilii. And when those stereocilii are physically bent to the side, that opens an ion channel that causes the cell to depolarize and initiates an action potential that we interpret as a sound wave. Now, what about pitch or noise, volume, changes in volume or changes in pitch? Our sense of pitch, so high frequency sounds or low frequency sounds, are determined by the wave or the frequency rate of the vibrations. If we have low frequency vibrations, they are going to stimulate a specific spiral organ at a specific location in the cochlea. High frequency noises stimulate a different spiral organ at a different location in the cochlea. For the volume of the noise you're listening to, that's going to be not related to how frequent the waves are vibrating in the cochlea through the pressure, but the volume is going to be related to the pressure of the wave. High pressure waves are going to cause more stereocilia, more hairs to be knocked over, and will be interpreted as a louder noise or a higher in volume. Low pressure waves will cause fewer hairs to be knocked over and that will send a weaker signal to the brain that's interpreted as a softer noise or something that's quieter. Any questions about our cochlea so far? Alrighty. Here if we zoom in closer on our spiral organ, you can see this tectoral membrane. And as this membrane moves, it pulls stereocilia from three different sensory cells, and then hair specifically from our hair cell as well. These four different sensory receptors within the spiral organ aid us not only with differentiation, pi differentiating pitch and volume, but also aid us with triangulating the location of a noise.
If you are chronically exposed to something that's 85 decibels or louder, that's going to be known as a loud noise. To give you an idea of what 85 decibels are, I want you to think of a loud engine. That's about 85 decibels. And this way of measuring the, the strength of a sound, this decibel, symbol, decibel scale, is a logarithmic scale. So as we go from 85 decibels to 86 decibels, there is a tenfold increase in the pressure wave. If we are constantly exposed to loud noises for a long period of time, or loud noises for a short, really, really loud noises for a short period of time, that causes damages to our hearing. Um, as we have damage occurring to our hearing, that can impact our mental health. For many geriatric patients, they lose the ability to hear high frequency noises later in life. This practically means that they have a very hard time understanding when people talk to them, particularly when females are trying to talk to them because females have a higher pitch in voice. It's one of the reasons why at a nursing home, the patients typically will seem to be ignoring female nurses, but pay attention to the male nurses. Many times they physically don't have the ability to hear those higher frequency noises anymore. In addition to mental health issues, the noise pollution can also cause lack of sleep. And not sleeping can correspond or contribute to those mental health issues, or can correspond or correlate to a decrease in productivity or an increase in anxiety. So, what can you do about noise pollution? Well, you can do simple things, like close the window or put in earplugs. You can have cochlear implants done, but they don't necessarily help you with noise pollution in general. I suppose you could turn them off well, yeah, but if you wanted to not hear the noise. Correct. If somebody has permanent damage to their cochlea, many times there can be an artificial cochlea embedded in their ear called a cochlear implant that will allow them to hear. when somebody has tubes put in their ear? Yeah. So if somebody is at risk of having frequent ear infections. Yeah. So let's talk about having tubes put in your ears. If you are at risk of having frequent ear infections, you are having lots of fluid build up in that middle ear area. Okay. And as fluid builds up in the middle ear, oftentimes it becomes pressurized. To help relieve the pressure, sometimes phys surgeons will put a tube and embed it in the tympanic membrane that will allow the excess fluid building up in the middle ear to ooze out and equalize the pressure. In young children and infants, the auditory tube has a much narrower or much less pronounced slope a much shallower slope. And then adults, as we age, will have an increase in the pitch or an increase in the slope of the auditory tube. Practically speaking, we as adults have the ability to drain our middle ear pretty easily. So we're much less likely to develop an ear infection. Young children have a shallow auditory tube and it's much more difficult for them to drain fluid out of their middle ear and they are much more prone to developing an ear infection. As a random aside, I had tubes put in my ears when I was younger, and there's this awesome trick you can do when you're in the swimming pool if you have tubes in your ears. You can go to the underwater, plug your nose and blow really hard, and force air up the auditory tube, into the middle ear, out of the tube, and you can quite literally blow bubbles out of your ear. Eventually, if you have tubes put in your ears, those tubes will fall out of their own, and that small slice of the tympanic membrane will heal of its own accord. But typically, having those tubes put in your ears will allow you a year or two of increased drainage and decreased likelihood of developing ear infections. When there's an ear infection and there's an, an increase in pressure in the middle ear that cannot be relieved, that constant increase in pressure 
makes it difficult for the eardrum to vibrate. And if the eardrum is having difficulty vibrating, practically speaking, the person with the ear infection has a reduced ability to hear. Your mom did what? It was an old shirt from passed down through generations because she tried everything before taking it to the doctor to get the medicine. Mm -hmm. So she put the skillet on the stove, wrapped it in three, four towels, and laid my head on it. And it released the pressure. So your mother put your head on a hot skillet that was covered in towels. Right. It released the pressure. Oh, okay. But let it cool for a while, not right off the stove, of course. Okie dokie. It works. So, we have a concept check coming up. Why is it important to have both the oval window and the round window as part of the vestibule? What function does the, the round window serve? We have A, drains the middle ear, B, aids in our sense of balance, C, releases pressure increases, or D, allows for better low light vision. Now, one of those is a throwaway. <laughs> So what does that round window do for us? That is correct, Ashley. It is C. It relieves pressure increases. As the stapes presses against the oval window, Pressure increases in the inner ear and causes the round window to bulge outward. Let's focus on some more on the inner ear with our semicircular canals and our vestibule. So we focus on our sense of hearing. Let's focus on our sense of balance or equilibrium. If we look at our inner ear, we can detect angular movement and we can detect movement in the horizontal planes. This angular movement sometimes is referred to as dynamic equilibrium or rotational equilibrium. And then movement on our vertical planes are, is sometimes referred to as static or stationary or gravitational equilibrium. Our dynamic equilibrium or rotational equilibrium is based off the three semicircular canals and the ampulla, which is at the opening of each semicircular canal, our gravitational equilibrium, or static equilibrium, is going to be dependent on the urticals and saccules within the vestibule of our inner ear. So first, let's talk about static or gravitational equilibrium, because that's the easier one to understand. In our vestibule, we have a thick membrane of viscous fluid. And within that thick membrane of viscous, viscous fluid, we have little hair cells that stick up. And embedded in the jelly-like fluid of the thick membrane, we also have lots of little tiny bones. Those little tiny bones are called otoliths. <coughs> and when you lean your head down, or you lean backwards or forwards, gravity will cause that thick membrane to flow downward, whatever direction down is. That membrane will flow with the force of gravity, and the otoliths will pull on the little hairs. And as we pull those little hairs to the side, we can have that innate perception of what direction is down and what direction is up. And that's how we have our static or gravitational equilibrium. And if we look at the semicircular canals, those semicircular canals will have small ampulla present at them. And as fluid is flowing in or out of the semicircular canal, it will flow over the top of the cupula, which is part of our ampulla, and that will cause the cupula to bend back and forth. And as the fluid flows in and out of the tubes that make up our semicircular canals, that fluid will bend the cupula back and forth, causing hair cells 
to bend, which initiates an action potential. And depending on which specific ampulla we are stimulating, we translate that information as rotation in the X at plane, the Y plane, or the Z plane. Now, let's talk about getting dizzy again. Let's go back to the merry-go-round or spinning in a circle. If you are on a merry-go-round or spinning in a circle, your urtical and saccual will have hairs bending in different directions at the same time. So instead of having all the hairs bend the same direction, some hairs will bend down, some hairs will bend up, some bend to the left, some to the right, because instead of having the, the membrane flow down with the force of gravity, that membrane is being pressed against the side of your inner ear and flowing in multiple directions at the same time, giving you conflicting signals about your orientation in space. For those of you who've ever been to the county fair, have you ever ridden the Gravitron? Oh, it's an old ride where you hardly see it at the fair anymore, where they put you in a giant disc and spin you in a circle and you get stuck to the side of the wall with centrif centrifugal force, or centripetal force. And there's the same principle behind getting dizzy, where, as you spin in a circle, the hairs of your cupule are bent, excuse me, the hairs of your saccule are bent in many different directions as the fluid does not flow down, but instead gets stuck to the side of your vestibule. Any questions? So, concept check. Why are there three semicircular canals? Is it A, we need redundancy for safety's sake? B, to correspond with X, Y, and Z axes. C, to triangulate the location of the sound. Or D, one of the canals is a vestigial or functionless organ. We have a B and a C. Two Bs, how about you, Alyssa? It is B. The three semicircular canals correspond to the X, Y, and Z axes to allow us to better understand our sense of dynamic equilibrium as we are moving through space, as we move through three dimensions of space. Is this the, the vestibular nerve connects to the semicircular canals in the vestibule. The cochlear nerve will connect to the cochlea and both the vestibular and cochlear nerve merge to form the vestibular cochlear nerve. You could say the three dimensions of space. Yeah, because I'd have to do this. Then I'll think of that. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, that's all we have for our special senses. Um, we uh, went a little bit over on the lecture portion for tonight. But considering we had a lab exam, and instead of having two hours of lab, we had about 40 minutes of lab, we're still going to be getting out about a half an hour early. Do you have any last minute questions for me before we call our night? Do we have a lecture exam next week? You do have a lecture exam next week. I need to stop this recording. Doo -doo -doo.